introduce Dr. Stephanie Dole. Uh, she's been educating the public on insects since 1997. Uh, she holds a BS in entomology from UC Davis and received her PhD studying bark beetle diversity at Michigan State University, which included a description of five previously unknown beetle species and one new genus. Uh, her extensive experience as a scientist, educator, and researcher included teaching at Texas A&M, University of San Francisco, and the Curiosity. Curi yeah. Curiosity. Curiosity. They, they gave it a mouthful of a name. <laughs> Um, she has presented on insect, insects to the public at various universities across the country. Um, she has scientific research articles in journals, in journals such as Molecular Phylogenetics and Evolution and the Proceedings of the California Academy of Sciences. Uh, extensive field experience collecting and studying insects in the Ecuadorian Amazon, Guana, Thailand, the Sonoran Desert, the Sierra Nevada and throughout California. In 2016, she, fund, she founded her education business, Beetle Lady, um, which, through which she educates all ages on the wonders of anthropod diversity. Part of that Beetle Lady uh, business is her pop-up bug museum, which, some of you already know this, is at the museum. Um, and it will be at the museum tomorrow from 10 to 2, from 10 to 2 p.m. as part of our Bug Bonanza event that we have scheduled. So 10 to 2 tomorrow uh, at the museum. For those of you that would like to, ask for the talk after the Q&A, we will have a little sneak peek for those of you that would like to go, because uh, it's already set up in the lobby. So just so you know if you want to stick around for that. So with that, please welcome Stephanie, Dr. Stephanie Dole. Thank you. Thank you. And that's where the tarantula is. Two of them, actually. So, and they're, they're there, as far as I know. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for having me uh, for the MAPS lecture. I'm really, oh, let me turn this on, too. I have two mics. I'm double mic'd. Okay, that's a little better, huh? Thank you so much for having me for this lecture. I decided tonight that I would focus a little bit on my specialty of beetles um, and tell you a little bit even about my own research and how scientists uncover diversity and kind of the scope of insect diversity and beetle diversity specifically. Uh, this was kind of already covered by Arnold, but I am an entomologist and I have a business called Beetle Lady and that is a whip scorpion named Crumpet on my face. And through Beetle Lady, I do educational programs for all ages, and really all ages. I used to say uh, preschool through adults, and then the libraries would say, could you do baby story time? So we started having babies singing lullabies to tarantulas and things like that at the libraries. So I'm game as long as it involves terrestrial arthropods, insects, and, and their relatives. I'm happy to do it for all ages. And that's what kind of keeps it interesting. So I do different programs at libraries. This is me teaching my Bugs of Pokemon class class, um, which is one of my more popular classes because for those of you who grew up with Pokemon, you know that there's a lot of cool bugs in Pokemon, and if you know all their attacks and defenses and things like that, you also know a lot of insect biology as well. So it's a good in, and um, this display is over there as well as an Animal Crossing display if you're into that game as well. I also have the pleasure of teaching a high school entomology class at Design Tech High School, which is a charter school that was started on the campus of Oracle. Uh, I'm based in San Mateo, so this is um, one of the charter schools in Silicon Valley. And I get to take these high school students for three hours a day for two weeks, three times a year, and we just delve into bugs. And we hang out in the classroom and they hold tarantulas and we go to places like Cal Academy of Sciences. A big part of what I do too is just getting people outside, getting kids outside again. And they love it. Kids, regardless of what people say about this generation or that generation, kids still love being outside. They still love looking for bugs and they're happy to have a net in their hands. So, and then the, a big, big part, and this lecture is included, I never come without my ambassadors, my real friends that are going to change the hearts and minds of the people that I introduce them to, like this tarantula. 
Um, oh, and that should have gone with the other. And then I have this pop-up bug museum, which you'll get to see over um, there, and it's open today or tomorrow from 10 to 2 as well. And the idea with this is I could bring an, an entomology exhibit to a school or a library, a community group, and this is something that I rent out, and I come with it, and I'm basically man it for the day. I also do illustration of insects and art involving insects because I find insects are so beautiful. They inspire me and they make me want to express that love and awe um, through art. So that's another thing I like doing. And you'll also see my photographs throughout the, uh, the lecture as well. So let's start with the actual talk. Let's talk a little bit about beetles. Um, but before we get into beetles specifically, let's talk about how diverse insects are. Because if I could take one fact about insects and trans and into all of humanity's brain, this would be it. I think that to me, knowing how incredibly diverse life is on our planet is just one of the great joys of life. And even though I, a lot of people may not want to know how many bugs are actually out there, um, I think that it's, it's amazing because what most people think is biodiversity doesn't even scratch the surface when it comes um, to insects. So we all learned in school, and we've got some young people who could probably recite it better than the older folks in the audience, what makes an insect an insect. They have three main body parts. They have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. They always have six legs. This is actually a hard, hard rule with insects. It has to do with how their bodies evolved. The thorax has the legs, and it evolved from three ancestral segments that brought three pairs of legs with it. So they always have six legs. They have two antennae. Some um, arthropods don't have antennae. Things like uh, lobsters have antennae, millipedes have antennae, roly-polies have antennae, but um, tarantulas, for instance, and other arachnids don't have antennae. And these are important because they reach out into the world and they give them lots of information about what's around them. If they have wings, insects have four wings. The important thing is if you see an insect like an ant that doesn't have wings, that's a secondary loss. That means somewhere in its ancestry it did have wings. The only things that you might consider insects that have never evolved wings are things that people like me don't technically consider insects. We consider them non-insect hexapods, which means six-legged arthropods that aren't quite insects. These are things like your silver tails and your bristle, or silverfish and your bristle tails, right? Um, but otherwise, insects have wings, but sometimes they've later lost them. You'll meet a couple beetles tonight that no longer have them. And then they have these really cool eyes called compound eyes that are multifaceted and have lots of different lenses. So those are our basic insect characteristics. Now, when it comes to how diverse they are, this is the really extraordinary part. We are working on a list, scientists like me, of every single kind of insect, every species of insect that we encounter on our planet. We have over a million species on that list, and we're adding new ones by the tens of thousands every year. Um, because we're scientists, we can use computers and math to estimate how many there actually are before we discover and count all of them. These are the same kinds of computer algorithms we use to do um, population estimates. So let's say you're trying to figure out how many giraffes live in Africa. You're not going to literally count every giraffe in Africa. You're going to use mark release recapture techniques. Same statistics get used, but instead of individuals, it's species. And then we can run them through these algorithms. I'll show you some research I did later that uses those algorithms, and it gives you an estimate. The point is our lowest estimate is that we have at least five million insects on our planet, five million different species of insects. We've only found one of them, so that means we've only found 20% or one in five insects species on our planet. And I'm not finishing this work in my lifetime, neither are my colleagues. We need more people. So if those of you out there still deciding what to do for your careers or maybe wanting to totally change your life path, um, you want to discover new species, absolutely you can do that. We need people to do that because it's, it's, um, it's a crucial thing. And as you can probably appreciate, the loss of biodiversity that we're experiencing makes it even more crucial. Um, and if you compare this to other biodiversity, there's 10,000 species of birds approximately in the whole world and 5,500 species of mammals approximately. So this is a huge chunk. It would be much more accurate to show an alien, an insect, to show what life is like on Earth than to show them something like a mammal or a bird. Um, in our state of California, this is pretty interesting. We have 100,000 
insect species recorded from California. This is a tenth of the world diversity. Now, because so much of this undiscovered diversity is in the tropics, this percentage will probably go down as the number of discovered species goes up. But still, that's pretty extraordinary. So it's something, yet another thing to be proud of um, coming from this state. And again, in comparison, we have 223 species of mammals and 641 species of birds in our state. Uh, here's a, I'm going to drive this point home in a few other graphical ways. Uh, this is a, from the textbook Gullen and Cranston that I learned um, entomology from. These are two of my professors at UC Davis. And I love this picture because every animal or plant in it, every organism is basically drawn to scale according to how many species there are. So you can see that enormous fly looming over that tiny elk that it represents all mammals, including ourselves. Another way to look at it. These are our described species. And let me show you, I'm going to pause and I'm going to go to the document camera and show you how I teach this to young children. So I tell them, talk to them about how we've got a lot of insects on our planet. And there's a bunch of different ways we have a lot of insects on our planet. In this jar, I have 500 little plastic flies. That's how many babies one mother fly could have if all of her offspring survived to adulthood. That doesn't usually happen, right? They usually get eaten. That's an important role that insects play in nature. So even if you don't love insects, maybe you love birds, maybe you love lizards or frogs or other animals that depend on them. Similarly, in this jar, I've got 50 plastic cockroaches. That's how many babies can be in one mother cockroach's egg case at a single time. Um, so that's, that's a lot, right? And, and you know, it's a little chicken and egg. Do they all, do they have this many? offspring because they know so many will get eaten? Does so many get eaten because they have this many offspring? It's just the way nature works, right? But that's not the only way that there's a lot of insects on our planet. Let's talk about the number of species. So this elephant is a mammal like us. Let's see, is that going to be upside down for you guys? Okay, we'll do it that way. For every one kind of mammal like that elephant and like you and me, there are two kinds of birds. There are twice as many different kinds of birds on our planet as there are mammals like us. For every one kind of mammal and two kinds of birds, there's also two kinds of reptiles. And if you know modern biology, you realize birds and reptiles are the same thing, right? Birds are just living dinosaurs. So we have for every one kind of mammal, two kinds of birds, two kinds of reptiles. For every one kind of mammal, two kinds of birds, and two kinds of reptiles, there's one, two, three, four, five, six kinds of fish. There are six times as many different species of fish on our planet as there are mammals like us. That's not where most of life is. I bet you're going to guess where I'm going to say it is, right? It's in arthropods. So let's start with a non-insect arthropod. For every one kind of mammal, two kinds of birds, two kinds of reptiles, and six kinds of fish, there are 20 kinds of arachnids, spiders and scorpions, ticks, mites, things like that. Um, so there's a lot more of those than there are mammals like us. But finally, for every one kind of mammal, two kinds of birds, two kinds of reptiles, six kinds of fish, and 20 kinds of arachnids, there's a whopping 200 species of insects. And the amazing thing about this number is this is based on that known number of species, the described species, the species that scientists like me have written about given a name to deposited in insect collections and cataloged in this catalog of life we're working on. This number goes up a lot if you include everything that we haven't found yet that we know is out there. So let's show you, an, this is one way of looking at that. The lighter circle is the number of, of estimated species. So there's those numbers I showed you again. The low estimate for insects is 5 million. 1 million is how many we know. You could maybe even appreciate, we actually think we know a, a smaller percentage of the arachnid species um, than, than of the insect species. And then, there, you know, there are other groups like crustaceans and fish we're still discovering species. And when you get to mammals and birds, we think we've got it mostly covered, 98, 96%. Um, so that's, that shows you this extraordinary diversity. And if you're going to study biodiversity on our planet, you have to include insects and other arthropods. OK, so when biologists or scientists or curious people see this sort of thing, they go, why? Why is it that way? With insects, there isn't one answer. There's a bunch of different factors that come into it. One is their size. If you think about something like an elk, the forest is the elk's habitat. If you think of something like a small beetle, 
they have all of these smaller habitats within that forest. So their habitat could be the moss on the sides of trees. Their habitat could be the water that collects in a particular species of plant, right? So they partition the environment into smaller and smaller ecological niches, effectively. Their reproductive strategy, strategy has to do with this too. Insects reproduce really fast. They have quick generational turnover. They have, so mutations will go through the, the species faster. They'll end up you know, diverging and, and speciating much faster than a lot of other organisms. Insects are also the result of really good evolutionary timing. When the ancestors of insects came up onto land, there was tons of vegetation, but no animal life. And so these were the animals that came from the ocean that then exploited, so my, that's kind of a, I don't know, maybe that's a negative word we shouldn't be using. They, they you know, flourished in, on the land with all of this, this um, vegetation that was available to them. We also see, and I'm going to show you these on a map of insect evolution in a moment, that there are three key points in their evolution when insects got the ability to fly, when they got the ability to fold their wings up instead of just having them stuck out like a dragonfly, and when they evolved metamorphosis. And these points, we see an explosion in diversity when these happen, so we know that they're a big deal. Another point on the tree too, the timing of the evolution with uh, flowering plants. So when flowering plants show up, insect diversity becomes very similar to what it is today. We see a lot of our modern insect groups. Um, this is a new one that I've only just added in the last couple years. Um, one of my high school students actually brought it up to me because they had seen an article about it. Um, there, it's actually been shown that insects have a lower background rate of extinction compared to other organisms. So they're losing species slower than other organismal groups. Um, so this is a really complicated diagram, but this is essentially a map of insect evolution, of the diversity of these major groups of insects. These are all orders. That's what most of you would recognize. Most of you would be able to say, that's a beetle, that's a butterfly, that's a dragonfly. That's that level. That's where most people can identify a lot of insect groups. So let me just show you. Here's where wings show up. And these, the first insects that got wings, we call the paleoptera. These are the old winged insects. These are things like dragonflies, damselflies, and mayflies. Um, so they have these very kind of old style wings. Um, they can't fold their wings up. They're stuck with their wings out. So they can't, they basically can't climb into vegetation or under rocks or into wood without jacking up these delicate flying wings, right? So when we see wings show up, then shortly thereafter we see wings that can fold. So think of like a honeybee. They can fold their wings over their back. If they was, had their wings stuck out like a dragonfly, they wouldn't be able to go in the hive. And boom, we see this huge amount of diversity. All of these groups come off of that new winged insect, the Neoptera, having wings that fold. So we know all of the insects that we consider insects today evolved from the ones that had wings. Then boom, we have this other major group that come from ones that can fold their wings up. We'll get back to that with beetles too. Then we have metamorphosis show up. This metamorphosis branch is right there. And that's where we have all of the major, major groups. These make up 85% of insect life. So we know that metamorphosis was a really big deal. Going back to that smaller size thing, metamorphosis effectively lets them partition the environment also by age. So if you have something like a monarch butterfly, they're sipping nectar from a flower, their caterpillars, their offspring are eating the leaves of the flowers, the leaves of the plants. They're not competing with their own offspring for resources. And we think that's part of it. But even when they do eat the same thing, like a ladybug, their adults eat aphids, larvae eat aphids, they're still able to kind of partition out their life cycle and, and occupy these different, slightly different niches in these different parts of their life. And then beetles show up right here. And we're going to focus on beetles for the rest of the talk because they have metamorphosis, they have wings, they not only have wings that fold, but they have wings that fold in a super extra special, fancy, tricky way. And that's what we think made them so successful. So what is a beetle? <clears throat> that diagram, actually, that I showed you earlier, showing all the different parts of an insect, was a beetle. In fact, it's a, right, it's a kind of a goliath beetle. And we're going to see a live one shortly. Um, this is basic beetle anatomy. If you were going to look at this beetle from above, you'd think, OK, one, two, three body parts on an insect. This is easy. There's the head in the blue. There's the purple thorax. 
and there's the orange abdomen. One, two, three. I see three distinct parts. Beetles are a little tricky, though, because the thorax, this one isn't correct. Let's X that out so you know. <clears throat> Not correct. This is correct. All the legs are always attached to the thorax. If you're, if you're wondering, if you're looking at an insect and you're wondering what part is the head, what part's the thorax, what part's the abdomen, just remember the thorax has everything that helps the insect move. All the legs, all the wings are always attached to the thorax. If you see a leg attached to it, no matter what else you may think is going on, that is the thorax. With the beetle over, you can kind of get a more complete view of what the thorax is and what it encompasses. This beetle is going to demonstrate what makes beetles beetles. This beetle is why I have a rule that I always, always carry a bug jar with me because um, this was on, I was on a cruise to the Caribbean <laughs> with my friend and we stopped at a beach and this weevil was on our taxi cab that we took to the beach and I said, oh my gosh, this is such a beautiful weevil, I got to take some pictures of it. So we put it in the jar and she looked at me and rolled her eyes and said, I can't believe you actually had a bug jar with you on a cruise, um, but I did. And so there, um, this beetle's demonstrating what makes beetles beetles. What's happened with beetles is their front faces, those yellow parts, they have turned into a hard shell called elytra. And elytra basically function as armor for the delicate flying wings. And as you can see, the flying wings are actually much larger than the elytra. They actually fold up like origami. It's really cool. There are some cool videos that you could see on YouTube of uh, beetles folding their wings up. They have no muscles inside the wings, so they can fold them back up completely without um, muscles, just with this kind of like origami, like passive folding. Um, so yeah, that is what makes a beetle a beetle. And the reason we think this is such a key to success is now this animal and all its, rel all its beetle relatives can now go in all sorts of things. Think of dung beetles. You mentioned dung beetles earlier. They can crawl around in poop and then boop, open their wings and their wings are clean and they can fly away. We have, I'm gonna show you some beetles today that crawl around in wood. Um, so you have all these beetles, there's aquatic beetles, there's also we've got our youngest entomologist, I love it. Um, yeah, so we can, um, all of these beetles can go into all these places, they can cover these wings and then some beetles, you'll meet a few in a moment, have actually sealed those up and they don't even fly anymore. So let's now say how diverse these animals are, how diverse beetles are. Um, beetles are the order Coleoptera. I'm technically a Coleopterist. That's what I specialized in. Remember that one million described insect species? 450,000 of those are beetles. So that's like almost half. That's a lot. Um, and there's a saying about beetles, if you took every single plant and animal species on earth and you lined them up, every fifth would be a beetle and every tenth would be a weevil. Here's how I do that with kids. I teach them how to count like a beetle scientist, like a coleopterist. So when I look at the world and I see all the beautiful things, living things out in the world, I count like this. I go, one, two, three, four, beetle. <laughs> yeah, it feels good. You can do it with me. One, two, three, four, weevil. Yeah. So, you know, there's a huge, Huge, there's a, you know, uh, H.S. Haldane, the naturalist, said that from his study of the world, God had an inordinate fondness for beetles or something like that, right? This is a famous saying that um, he said, and Dar Charles Darwin started with beetles. Beetles are a big part of biodiversity. So let's meet some real live bugs, right? That's why I have the document camera. This is one of the most common groups that you will see in California in all sorts of habitats, but especially in drier, more arid habitats like um, this is a group called the Tenebrionids. Um, it's a family of beetles. So once after the order, which is beetles, then you break it down into families. Um, so the Tenebrionids, or as people who study them call them for short, Tenebs. That's what I would say to a colleague if I was out hunting bugs with them. We'd say, oh, look, look at Teneb. Um, there's about 20,000 species of these. Um, my friend, uh, my former lab mate, Dr. Aaron Smith, is specializing in these at Purdue University. In California, now this is a little bit of an old number, because basically in order to get a newly revised number of that, somebody has to do a literature survey, uh, uh, you know, has to actually like pull together all of the species descriptions and say, okay, how many species do we have in California now? And nobody's done that since 2014. So we had 447 species as of 2014. 
These are known for having chemical and death feigning defenses. I'm going to show you some death feigning in a moment. This one, sometimes people call them the picante beetle. Maybe you've seen them hiking or walking around here. They stick their rear up in, up in the air and they have a kind of a, a strong smelling um, liquid that comes out and it's a great chemical defense. It smells bad. It can stain your hands like a henna tattoo. They're very long lived. In fact, when parents ask me what bug pets should I get for my kids, these are the ones I love because they're long lived, they're easy to care for, they are desert adapted so kids can be in charge of feeding them and watering them and they don't die easily. So, um, so I'll show you some of the diversity in this group, in this, I pulled a few from a tank. Okay, here, I should look up on here so I can see what I'm seeing. Um, so this is kind of your standard picante beetle. Um, and so this is the one you'd see walking around hiking trails. This one I, I gosh, I don't even remember where I collected this one, but somewhere local-ish. And, and so this one would stick its rear end up in the air. And, and these are all a group that actually don't fly. So my tank that I keep these on um, don't, doesn't have a lid usually. This is like a little travel thing. So this, these are called black death feigning beetles. And a black death feigning beetle will pretend to be dead. Let's see if he'll do it. <laughs> Sometimes only for a little bit. Um, and then a relative, we have the blue death feigning beetle. Oh, and he'll, these guys often do it even better. <laughs> and you can see a little twitch, right? Like, eh, I'm, I'm a smart human, you can't fool me. Um, and these guys are neat because the reason you might even notice how it looks darker now that I turned it over, it's, it's, the blue is actually a wax that it excretes to retain water. And so when it gets on my sweaty, nervous hand, it turns darker again. Um, this one is a smooth death feigning beetle. So, oh, and this one's doing a great job. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. Yeah, you can see it. You know it's not dead. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea of some of the diversity of these. And, they, and, and these are all kind of relatively the same size. I've kept like really teeny, 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 tiny ones of these. Um, it's a really diverse group. It's a really interesting group of beetles. Um, yeah, and this will show you some more diversity. Here's two that I just showed you. The black death feigning beetle, the blue death feigning beetle. That's a little hairy one. It's like a woolly death feigner, I think they call it. This is an ironclad beetle. Um, and another defense that these beetles have, and actually material scientists have studied the configurations of their exoskeleton. They kind of fit together like puzzle pieces. So even if you're not gonna be an entomologist, there's a lot of ways, like my high school class, we do a project called Insect Innovations where students talk about ways that like earwig wing, wing folding has been used for designing solar sails. Um, you know, these guys, their material scientists have studied their exoskeleton because it's incredibly strong and rigid, but also a little bit flexible too, because it actually has these weird puzzle piece kind of joints in it, so it can compress. So you can run over these with a truck and they will not die. Um, but if you tried to eat one, it would break your tooth for sure. So um, in fact, I can't pin them when they die. I have to use like a little nail because they, they just break an insect pin. Um, so there's lots of ways that insects can inspire us in the way that they've innovated for their lives. Okay, so let's, we've, we saw these desert death feigning beetles. Um, let's talk about some other ecological roles that beetles play. This is just going to kind of be a pretty slideshow of photos of beetles from around the world that I've taken, um, demonstrating some of the different roles that they play. Pretty much everything you can imagine, almost. I mean, nothing marine, but everything terrestrial that you can imagine, and some aquatic freshwater as well. So beetles can be scavengers. This is a kind of a, a, a hide beetle that I photographed at a light trap in Arizona. These guys love coming to carrion that's at the point where it's just like jerky, it's leathery, it's just the skin that's left over, it's totally dry and desiccated. Um, this is a leaf beetle in the um, cloud forests of Ecuador. So they have these neat foot pads that kind of look like heart shaped and those are specially adapted for holding on to slick leaves. Leaf beetles come in all sorts of beautiful colors and too. Um, and these are herbivores. Um, flower feeding beetles. Uh, beetles are horrible landers. So uh, if, if you have a flower that's pollinated by beetles, it's often very large, kind of like a crash landing pad. <laughs> um, so they, 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 and often white, they don't really care very much about color. 
Um, so pretty much with a beetle, any landing is a good landing. They just, that you can walk away from it. And it doesn't matter. They don't, they're not like a dragonfly where they're just gonna go very gracefully and land somewhere. They pretty much crash everywhere. So um, this, they're flower feeders and some of them are pollinators. Um, these are an interesting kind of beetle. When you get into something that has 450,000 species, they don't like to all look the same and follow the rules. So this is called a net wing beetle, and their wings almost make them look moth or butterfly-like in a way. But they just, that's the same wing case, and it's just broad. And these guys are all over these flowers. This is one of the largest kinds of beetles that you'll find out where I live. I think you can get them out here. They, you, definitely in the Sierra foothills. These are prionis beetles. They're a wood feeding beetle, longhorn beetle. Um, they will, will hear a beetle make a noise in a moment, but they, um, they will make a squeaking noise and they've got a good pinch, but um, that's, that's it. And they're huge. They're few, you know, like two and a half, three inches long. So they're one of our largest beetles around here. There are no beetles that are venomous except one. We used to say there's no venomous beetles. And then somebody went and discovered a relative of these guys, another longhorn beetle um, in the rainforest, I think of Ecuador, that had a spur that has venom. But that's it. Other than that, unless you're crawling around the rainforest, and you're not going to ever encounter a venomous beetle. The, the worst they can do is give you a good pinch with their jaws. Or if you eat them, then that might get worse, but don't eat them. Um, this is, there's fungus feeder beetles. This is a little knitted dulid beetle. These guys love fermentation and they love fungus. And so you'll, you'll see them at, at um, fungus like this. Um, these and also the beetles I studied for my dissertation because they like fermentation. Sometimes you'll spend all day looking for them and then you'll go to the field station and crack open a beer and one will fly right into it. So it's, it's, that's actually a way that we trap beetles a lot is we'll put out little cups of like beer or something for some of these ones that like fermentation. Dung feeders are dung beetles, right? Predators. This is a, um, a kind of a carabid ground beetle. This is a really diverse group. This is one of the most common types, uh, families of beetles I'll see in urban areas. This larger one is in uh, San Diego area in Anza Borrego. Um, but these are great predators. Um, they just run around really fast and eat up other bugs. This is what some people say is the beetle in North America. This is called the glorious scarab beetle, and that's my son's hand. Um, and these guys are in southern Arizona during the monsoon season. They're beautiful, they're metallic, they're very almost tropical kind of a scarab beetle. Um, and other scarab beetles, this is a local, a local one in the redwoods. Um, you know, just, and you, some of you have probably seen these 10 line June beetles. This, is, this one was in Santa Barbara. Um, leaf beetles all over the place, lots of diversity in leaf beetles, long-legged ones, cute-faced ones, colorful ones. And you see all that, that kind of the same, that heart-shaped pad. Uh, this is a ladybug, which is a kind of a beetle. Um, coccinellids are, that's the family. They're incredibly diverse. They're not all red with black dots, and they're all uh, good predators, and they're a really interesting group. There's I think at this point there's over 3,000 species of ladybugs. Uh, that's, a, that's actually, these are all, these are tenebrionids. So this is that first group we met. You can see some of the other forms in that. Uh, stag beetles, more of those uh, feather wings and um, beetles. Some beetles have soft wings. <clears throat> some beetles have scales like a butterfly. This is an iridescent weevil. Uh, this one again is from Ecuador. Same with that one and that one. Lots of cute weevils. I think this looks like the spy versus spy guy, if any of you remember those from that magazine. And you know what this one's doing. It's just faking it. So weevils will do that as well. Um, fireflies are also beetles. You may not realize because we call them fireflies, but they are. And there's a lot of diversity there. These are blister beetles. Um, they have a powerful, um, a powerful chemical defense that'll literally give you blisters. And they warn you about it. They show you that they've got that defense with, that, with their posture and with their bright red coloration. 
And this is a bombardier beetle, which you may have heard people talk about. These have this chemical, exothermic chemical reaction that's um, hotter than boiling water, and they mix. Uh, it's basically an enzyme that they mix with another chemical that is the catalyst to the chemical reaction. And these guys are really amazing. And that whole group is full of chemical defenses. So it's not at all a mystery how they evolved this defense, regardless of what you'll hear. And uh, I want to show you this guy, and then I've got the easiest new beetle to show you. And then we'll meet some live beetles. Um, so this, these are one of my favorites. This is a Harlequin longhorn beetle. And this is a male, and they have these incredibly exaggerated front legs like that. The females don't have the front legs like that. This beetle can be about four inches long, just the body. The legs, you know, add a huge amount to that. And one of the things about these, I got to photograph them flying in the rainforest. They have a relationship with a pseudoscorpion. Do you see this little guy right there? Here, I'll circle. I think I have a circle for him. So it's, yeah, and it's, it's not as tiny as you'd think, because this beetle's huge. So it's, you know, it's maybe like 8 millimeters or 10 millimeters. It's, it's, you know, it's a good-sized little pseudoscorpion. And they have one that lives under their wing case. They always do. Um, it's kind of uh, STD of these beetles, because that's how they trans pass them on to other beetles. Like, that's how they, the, the scorpion reproduces, and then their offspring climb onto another beetle that way. Um, but they're actually, they're fairly, um, they don't really seem to hurt the beetles at all, and they're always there. So I think that that's a really cool relationship. This is a new thing I've added um, to, to tell you about just, just today. So these guys are called uh, staphylinid beetles, or rove beetles. These guys will look a little bit to you, maybe minus the pretty colors, they look a little bit like an earwig. And that's because they've actually reduced those wing cases so much that they just have this little teeny little thing up here, and then their entire wings can pop out of that. This is a really crazy, understudied, diverse group of beetles. There's a, a husband and wife scientist team who work on these at the Field Museum in Chicago. And they uh, just recently, just like two weeks ago, three weeks ago, a paper came out with one of the craziest ones of these. So this is a staphylinid beetle. You can kind of see, oh, I should have brought a pointer. You can kind of see where the little wing cases are there. See, there's the antennae and the head and the thorax and those little wing cases. These guys live in termite nests, and that entire bulbous apparatus is its abdomen, and it basically is mimicking a termite. It looks like it has a giant decoy termite on its body, which is a little surprising because there's a lot of insects that'll get into things like ant nests and termite nests, and all they really need to do is smell like the termite or the ant because they're so pheromone driven that they'll, they'll take care of a butterfly actually that um, it gets ants to take care of its babies. They're, it's caterpillars, they get ants to raise them. And um, this little caterpillar, it's like way bigger than any of the ant larvae, but it totally gets the ants to care for it because it smells like a baby ant and it makes noises like a baby ant. But so it's a little surprising that these guys took this this far, but this is a brand new discovered species of this, of this crazy beetle that pretends to have a giant termite on its back. <laughs> and it, yeah. Okay, so let's, let's, another thing about the diversity of beetles is they go through metamorphosis. And I want to show you a little bit about that and then introduce you to a really impressive large beetle. How's our time? Oh, good. So beetles go through metamorphosis just like a butterfly. This is some kind of large scarab larvae that I uncovered in, um, in Ecuador when I was photographing bugs there. Um, let me show you under this a life cycle. So all beetles, all insects, we're over here now, start out as an egg. So this is just a little model of an egg in the dirt. And in fact, in that cage of the animal that I'm going to show you now, we've found dozens of these eggs. We're really happy, me and my friend, who are raising these together. Then out of that egg comes a larva. Uh, think of this as a beetle caterpillar. Um, sometimes people call them grubs in the cases of beetles. Um, but that is a larva, and if you see these little black dots, oh, let me turn it this way. Um, the little black dots on this model, and you'll see them in the video I'm going to show you in a second, those are its breathing holes. Fun fact, insects don't breathe through their heads at all. They breathe through um, parts of their thorax and abdomen, so down their sides of their body, they have these nostril-like things. And then that will do just what a caterpillar does. It'll turn into a pupa. So this is the equivalent of a chrysalis for a beetle. Again, these are just models, plastic models of it. Um, and this is going to be a rhinoceros beetle, so it has to have this long horn. You'll see a real one in a moment. When it emerges, 
looks like that. And that's because the horn in this actually had that structure there. Eep, sorry, my brain doesn't work backwards. Um, so this, this could get hardened and darkened, whereas the wings had to unfurl, just like when you raise a, a baby butterfly, you'll get wings that unfurl, right, when they come out of the chrysalis. And eventually they harden up and look like this. So let me show you that. So think about this animal partitioning its life cycle too. Usually larvae of large beetles like this eat rotting wood and roots underground. Um, they'll often also turn around your thoughts about adults versus childhood and the length of either. Um, many, many insects spend the bulk of their life as a larva, and some will even emerge as an adult that has no functioning mouth parts. They live such a short amount of time, they just need to mate and lay eggs. So this is courtesy of the fact that there's a huge beetle rearing hobby in Japan. Let's even start that again. So it starts out and then a larva. Now this is a huge beetle, so it's going to be a really huge grub. Um, and those are the breathing holes. It's my dream to go to Japan someday to see the, the beetle rearing um, stuff that they have there and the, the beetle conventions. So as it's going to be a, a, a rhinoceros beetle with a long horn, it's got to develop that horn. Pupae don't eat, they don't walk, but they can wiggle. So as this person is holding it, that's the beetle pupa. And And when they rear these, they often put them in, flor this is florist fo foam. In the wild, these beetles will make like a little case. In fact, the beetle that I'm going to show you live in a moment, when the larvae get really big, what we're supposed to do is put clay in their soil, and then they can make these kind of almost like a little Easter egg. And then they're in, like inside like one of those Easter eggs or the chocolate eggs with a toy inside. And there, just as I showed you, those wings are brand new, so that exoskeleton hasn't done what we call sclerotized yet. It hasn't hardened. Basically, the chemical bonds haven't completely formed. Um, and then once the beetle is hardened, it looks like that. And even though these are so spectacular, the ones like this and the one I'm going to show you now, the adult part of the life stage is, is only a few months, three to six months, depending on the species. So I'm going to show you some Goliath beetles. Um, here, let me jump to this slide and show you kind of some of the diversity of Goliath beetles. So this is this group called Goliathus. It's a genus. A genus, for those who don't know, is a, is a grouping of species, of related species that we think have a really close evolutionary background. And these, this group, Goliathus, all occurs in Central African um, countries. And they have a little bit of variation. And there's about five, six species of Goliathus. And the one that I want to show you now is Goliathus orientalis. Um, let me bring him out. The reason I'm going to put him on a glove is not because he's going to hurt me by biting me or anything. It's that he has claws that are designed for uh, holding on to bark. So if I held him on my bare hands, which I have done sometimes, I end up with scratches like I've been playing with a kitten all day. So there he is. This is the male. Um, and actually, with these guys, they have the hard wing cases, and then they have a soft, almost velvet-like um, hair on the outside of it. It's not technically a hair, because then he'd be a mammal. Um, it's very similar to the scales on the wings of a butterfly. Um, so a beetle like this, he actually is completely a fruit and sap feeder. He'll do a little shinny. That's, uh, it's interesting. It's a little defensive shimmy thing that he does. Um, and then I've got a female in there too. She often buries herself under the dirt because he's pestering her if she doesn't. And she also goes down there to lay her eggs. So thankfully we've got eggs and we've got, um, at last we dug through the dirt. We had one that's actually a larva that's maturing. And these guys can fly, let's see, last time, I, I, this guy I haven't gotten to open his wings. I'm not gonna let him, see why I wear the glove? Okay, let's see. I've got the girl to open her wings for a group. He might not. My other ones I used to have, he would always open his wings. Nah, okay. Um, but, yeah, so these are, um, and we'll have, I'll tab this out at the pop-up museum tomorrow, part of the day. We'll, we have a scheduled time where I'll bring beetles out and people can touch them and um, also bring a tarantula out. And see why I wear the glove? 
He's not um, to let you know a little bit about these, these are now legal to keep as pets in the U.S. They used to not be simply because anything that isn't declared legal is illegal. Does that make sense? Um, and these guys were made legal due to the lobbying of some friends of mine who re rear them for the insect zoo field. The only trouble is they now still cost about $200 each and they only live three to six months. And uh, this one was, is from Los Angeles. So the breeder was in Los Angeles. So that's why me and my friend are hoping to maybe have a few so that I can always have some for classes without paying that kind of money for them. Um, so yeah, just gorgeous. You can see how beetles like this would inspire things like African textiles and, um, and design. They're just incredibly beautiful. Um, the last beetle I want to show you is a best beetle. And I have a funny story about these. I would have forgotten this story had it not been for a friend of mine who has the best memory on earth. But when I was looking at grad schools, I went to different universities and was checking out their programs. And I was in Texas checking out the program. And we went out collecting bugs, and I was so excited. And I grew up in the heart of Los Angeles. We don't have bugs like this in LA. And so I went out collecting with the entomologist, and I found some of these best beetles which are very common there. And I got super excited. And one of the Texas entomologists turned to me and said, those are just junk bugs. <laughs> so when I got these for Beetle Lady, my friend Deanna, who I went to school with at Davis and studied entomology with, said, oh, you got junk bugs. <laughs> and I laughed because I'd completely forgotten that story. So they also have a lot of other names. They're called best beetles, patent leather beetles, because they look like the patent leather on a shoe, um, uh, Betsy beetles, um, Pasali beetles, because they're a uh, scientific group, uh, their family name is Pasalidae. And these are really cool because they um, are a pre-social group of insects. They feed only on rotten wood. And the whole deal with them feeding on rotten wood is you will have, here I'll use this again, you will have adult beetles like this beetle. This is what they're going to look like, much smaller though. And they live in the rotten wood. They are about as good at digesting rotten wood as you are, meaning they're horrible at it. They can't digest ro uh, rotten wood. They can't digest any wood. But in their guts are bacteria, not um, single cell organisms like you have in things like termites. They have a single cell organism living in them that helps them. These are actually have bacteria instead of the protozoans. Um, so inside them, they have this bacteria. So that means when their larvae hatch out like this, they can't eat the only food their species eat. And this is why we uh, think that they're pre-social. They basically have to live in a group with adults and offspring of different generations. Sometimes the adults are the parents of the offspring, but there's a mix. They're not always. And the adults will make a sound to call to their offspring. I don't think they got the sound hooked up on this, right? OK, that's fine, because I'll just do it with the comb. Um, so they do make sound. Remember, they don't, have, um, they don't breathe through their mouth, so they're not going to make sound like I'm making sound. Uh, insects often make sound by rubbing parts of their body together. So these guys do something called stridulation, which is like me rubbing this finger on this comb. And if you ran it on a different part of the comb, it'd sound a little different. And this is a one way that insects make sound a lot. So the way that the adult beetles, and I will have these at the pop-up museum, I can, I'll hold one in my hand when we're over there. And if anybody wants to listen, I'll hold it up to your ear. They actually rub their wing cases against their abdomen. So the adults go, and the babies come up, the larvae come up, and they feed them mouth to mouth, and they inoculate them with their bacteria. And now the baby can eat. Anybody notice anything wrong about this larva? <laughs> What? It's got legs. It, how, yeah, how many legs does it have? Four. So they do have legs. Some insect larvae don't like maggots. Some do. But it only has four. And the reason it only has four is, you know, that's the recording, is the larvae actually, their little hind legs have evolved into like a guitar pick. It's like a little tiny, tiny nubbin of a leg. And it rubs against a part of the body. So the adults don't think to call to them. They call to the adults in the same way with stridulation, and the adults come up and feed them and share their bacteria with them. Um, so it's, it's really a really cool system. So I'll show you. Maybe we can even hold it up to the mic. But if not, I, I love teaching with these because I can hold them up to, let's see, is that one going to be very loud? Oh, this one's loud. I don't know. 
Now, you gotta, you gotta hold it up to your ear. So I'll walk around with one of these um, when we go next door. Um, but, oh, let me show it to you in my hand. So that's, and you can see how shiny, right? Wow. One of the biggest challenges, um, I learned a lot of my insect photography from an ant photographer, and he like has to really struggle with how do you diffuse light? How do you keep from getting that shiny, shiny, shininess too shiny, right? Um, but I'll have these tomorrow, and I'll, I'll keep one in my hand tonight, maybe. And if you want to hear what they sound like, I can hold it up to here, because he's very loud, um, but just doesn't mic up very well. Oh my gosh, I took so long talking about this. I didn't talk about my research. Oh, we've got a couple minutes. Okay, we're going to do this. We're going to go really fast into, into uh, how we discover diversity. So one of the fun things about um, looking for new species is bug hunting is fun, right? How many kids in here have gone looking for bugs or how many of you looked for bugs as kids, right? It's fun. One of the most common comments I get from um, my high school class is, I feel like a kid again when, I, when we play with the bugs, right? And it's fun when you get to go to rainforests and check out. I've gotten to go all over the world. This is me working with my colleagues, Sawa Pasanta Chai in Thailand, looking for bark beetles there. And then you get to bring them back and study them and you know, catalog them and all of that. So let me tell you really quickly one part of my research that I did that's um, how we, and this kind of tells you how this work gets done, how we uncover some of this diversity. I studied bark beetles, which are a kind of a weevil technically, and you may know these as being great forest pests. They're of great concern. Technically, that's how my PhD was funded. Unfortunately, I just got you all excited about studying biodiversity. One of the problems is funding. And so when you have groups like bark beetles, there's an economic reason for the government. So NSF funded my PhD. Um, sadly, there's a lot of things that have no economic importance to humans, and so we don't see it as worthwhile studying. So um, those are the ones that are a little harder to get the money to study. But in this group, there's 7,500 described species. And at the time I undertook this work, fewer than 50 species has been recorded from all of Ecuador, which contains a lot of the Amazon. That didn't seem very likely, right? So I got invited to work with a professor from the Smithsonian Institute who had been studying the canopy uh, fauna, all the animals that live in the rainforest canopy. And that's the insects that live really high up, because entomologists, we're only so tall, we're looking down at the bottom of the forest, there's a whole other world up there. So we wanted to know what kind of beetles we'd find in this canopy, in these bark beetles. Um, this is Dr. Terry Irwin. And he was my colleague and mentor with this project. He'd been doing it since I was in high school in the early 90s. Um, and I got to go in with him in uh, 2006 and collect with him. Basically, we would fog with a very quick acting um, and then also very quickly biodegrading insecticide. We'd basically knock down every insect in one of these trees. They, we would uh, collect them into these kind of... Uh, tent net things, tarp things, and there's a jar at the bottom, and we'd sample that tree, and then we'd take them back, and this is what the cabinets at the Smithsonian look like. Um, in that, I looked at over a thousand samples, because um, I looked at the ones we collected and the ones he had collected long before I was involved, and I found bark beetles in 69% of them, in most of them. Um, 2,500 uh, scolotines, bark beetles, were collected in that. And we do something at this stage where we identify morpho species. So that looks different from that, looks different from that, looks different from that. In insects, morpho species is always an underestimate, pretty much, because we have a lot of cryptic species, things that you have to like sequence their DNA or look at their genitalia under a microscope to actually know is this a different species from that. So, I mean, that's huge, right? We went from having 50 species from Ecuador to over 400 in just doing the sampling. So that shows you how this work gets done. Of course, this was over decades that the sampling was being done. Um, we described new species and a new genus, which was really exciting to get to discover a new genus of bark beetle, too. And this uh, actually hadn't, this was a minor part of my dissertation, so it didn't get published until 2002, 2001, 2000. Um, and unfortunately, it was because Dr. Irwin passed during the COVID ep epidemic, and so we had his, um, we had a memorial issue of the, one of the journals that he had founded. But, you know, it shows how much we can uncover once we look. I'm going to skip that part, and do one quick, yeah, we got enough time. Because you want to hear how you can help, right? Because you're all excited about how can I help conserve all this beauty that you've now awoken me to, right? 
So um, let me tell you a little bit about one of the problems with insect conservation. And this is a story that um, is, was amazing when I heard it and not surprising at all. I mentioned I grew up in Los Angeles in the 80s. When I grew up in Los Angeles, one of the big stories they taught us in elementary school was about the California condor. And this amazing program that was being done at the LA Zoo, where they were pulled all the condors out of the wild, brought them in captivity to breed them. When they did that, they caused the extinction of another species. They deloused all of the California condor. They had a species-specific louse that lived on them not found on any other bird in the world. It happens with these species-specific insects, right? Um, so they knowingly, in a conservation effort for one species, caused the extinction of another species. And, you know, maybe some of you are thinking it's a louse. Who cares, right? Maybe, you know, but there was no proof that it was causing, it wasn't part of what was causing them to go extinct. It, every bird has lice species on them. Um, it's part of their ecosystem. Um, and this is, just ask yourself, how do we decide what's worth protecting, what we value, what we think is good enough? I've talked about beautiful beetles. There's beetles that aren't as beautiful. Um, and is it just when something's beautiful or worthwhile to us that we think it's worth protecting? Um, so I just, I thought that was really interesting. A couple, so just changing our attitudes is one thing we can do. Um, one other thing that's done in some places is captive breeding and release. In fact, one of the only insects that has a captive breeding and release program is the American bearing beetle, which is one of our few listed endangered uh, beetles in, in North America. Not because there aren't plenty of endangered beetles in North America, it's just people don't really care enough. So usually you only have butterflies listed as endangered species. Um, but this is an amazing beetle. Habitat preservation. And the good news about habitat preservation is you can get people excited about preserving the forest for the tiger. Well, if you preserve the forest for the tiger, guess what? You've preserved the forest for all those beetles that live in it with the tiger. So entomologists are largely okay with kind of just piggybacking on these large charismatic animals that it's easier for people to love because we're really protecting the same habitat often. What's a really cool thing about insects, and I've seen this in my own home and my own life, when it comes to insects, we don't just have to sit there and like when you're watching the nature documentary and you're like, oh, I owned a few acres in Tanzania, I would this and this and this and this. Well, all of us, because their habitats are so small, we can make a difference. We really can. I threw, I took out my entire lawn seven years ago and replaced it with native plants. And I had lectured about how this was something that was good to do. I was blown away by what I saw. And even if you have an apartment, just a little porch to put something on, basically we create these corridors where the insects can have their habitats. And, and a single plant, I mean, my kids' school, for instance, they had this whole area of bushes and there were all of these skippers, they're a relative of butterflies, they're like little fuzzy butterflies, all over the bushes. They took it out and paved it this year. I've never seen, I haven't seen a single skipper at my kids' school since then. So there's these little things. You may think one bush isn't going to make a difference, but when it comes to insects, we really can make a difference in just looking, finding out what plants. Uh, we have a great website in California called Calscape where you can look up what plants are host plants for your uh, local butterflies and moths and other insects. So I highly recommend um, looking that up because they're also often drought tolerant and things like that. And finally, if you just leave the leaves a little bit, try to not rake and clean everything up because that's where the pupae are, that's where the larvae are, that's where a lot of the life cycle is happening. Okay, I have gone over by a minute. So I'm just gonna leave you with pretty beetles and hope that you come to the pop-up museum tonight or tomorrow. And yeah, thank you.